Hello and welcome to the Oncology Podcast, an Australian oncology perspective. For more info and to sign up to our weekly newsletter, visit our website, oncologynews.com.au. Thanks for listening. Hi, this is Rach Babin. Today we have an exciting new addition to the Oncology Podcast with the first in our Oncology Journal Club series. The Oncology Journal Club is delivering oncology news differently with an update of an old concept in a new format. In each episode, a team of expert contributors will review and analyze the latest journal papers. Today's episode is presented by Professor Eva Segaloff from Monash University. Eva is a medical oncologist and director of medical oncology at Monash Health in Melbourne, Australia. She is joined by Dr. Craig Underhill from Albury Wodonga and Professor Hans Prennan from Antwerp, Belgium. Links to all of the papers we discussed today are in the notes. We hope you enjoy listening. This is Rachel Bavin and this is the Oncology Podcast. Hiya, everybody. My name's Eva Segalov. It's a pleasure to present this inaugural edition. Craig and I were reminiscing about the old days when you got a tape, a cassette in the mail, and you put it in your car and listen to it on the way to work to bring you up to date with all the latest news in the journals. Today, we've got podcasts, webinars, journals online. We've almost got too much information. So we thought that distilling it down in a podcast every week where we discuss three or four papers in depth and then a couple of very quick, quirky papers might be useful. But for today, I'd love to ask my uh, fellow podcasters to introduce themselves. Over to you, Dr. Craig Underhill. Thanks, Eva. Uh, So I'm a medical oncologist in Albury Wodonga in regional Australia. I uh, also work with the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre as a regional lead. Although I have some specialty interests, as a regional oncologist, I look after a broad range of tumour types. So hopefully I can bring some of that everyday perspective to this podcast. Hi, Eva. My name is Hans Peden. I'm a medical oncologist and I'm very glad to be here on board. I'm a big fan of Australia, as you know. So why am I on board for this podcast? So actually, I was with you for a three-month sabbaticals. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, I had to return a little bit earlier to Belgium. But I'm very glad I'm still involved and be able to participate in this uh, podcast. So you can already tell that he's going to be the popular member of the team because he's got that sexy European accent, Eva. Yes, Craig, we'll see if you can dazzle them, though, with your analysis. So we will go to our first paper of the week. And, Craig, I'll invite you to discuss the primary results from the Phase 3 IMSPIRE 150 trial and evaluation of atezolizumab, covimetinib and venurafenib in previously untreated patients with BRAF B600 mutation positive advanced melanoma. This was presented at the plenary of AACR, albeit virtually, by our very own Grant MacArthur. Craig, tell us what was found and what implications does this have for Australian patients? Okay, thanks, Eva. So this was an interesting study. It was a positive study. So as you mentioned, presented at the opening plenary session at the AACR, which this year had to go online as a webinar with some discussion by messaging at the end of each presentation, some good discussion. So that's probably the way of the future with these international meetings. At the same time, this paper is impressed and Lancet was mentioned during the presentation. So this was a large randomised phase three study in patients with advanced melanoma, previously untreated, or with the BRAF 600 uh, mutation. So the standard of care in Australia now has changed since this trial was designed but basically it was a randomization between standard combination MEK inhibitor and BRAF inhibitor versus the same combination with the addition of a tezolizumab. So I said treatment naive patients are all unresectable stage 3C or stage 4 patients and it was a positive study it showed a difference in the progression free survival for these patients so it's interesting that initially uh, at three months, there was really no difference, but then quite good separation of the curves 
ultimately there was a difference of 15.1 months in favour of the triplet arm versus 10.6 months in the standard BRAF inhibitor, MEK inhibitor combination with a hazard ratio of 0.78, so quite significant results. Now it's early follow-up for the survival. It did show a small difference, 28 versus 25 months. But as I said, it's not long enough follow-up to really show a difference. And interestingly, the duration of response was markedly different with a difference of 21 months versus 12 months. So we knew as part of the design of this study that one of the interesting things in melanoma is we know that the BREF inhibitors often have a higher response rate than checkpoint inhibitors in this population of patients, but a less durable response. So one of the intentions was to see A, that there was better survival and B, that there was a longer duration of response and certainly it showed that with an interesting tail on the curve that we see now quite often with melanoma studies. So there was some controversy over the comparator arm. So since this study was designed, the standard treatment now, there's a choice really between the combination BRAF inhibitor and MEK inhibitor, but for poor patients with visceral metastases, high LDH, the standard has really become a combination of CTLA-4 inhibitor and a pd one inhibitor. So this study added just a single agent pd one inhibitor rather than the combination. But similar to those studies with the combination of CTLA-4 inhibitor and checkpoint inhibitor that are showing about a 40% five-year progression-free survival, the tail on this curve was looking similar. So the toxicity of that combination CTLA-4 inhibitor and checkpoint inhibitor is considerable and in this study there was really no concerns about the safety profile so it was an interesting results and it'll be great to see when it's published in the peer review journal and discussed more broadly thanks craig that's a great analysis is it more expensive do you think this triplet than the mech inhibitors are followed by the immunotherapy or are we just changing the order and the combinations of the agents for these patients well, two aspects there, of course, it's going to be more expensive if we add a checkpoint inhibitor into this combination, but it'll ultimately, whether it gets reimbursed in countries like Australia that look at cost effectiveness as the endpoint, it'll be interesting to see whether that, that bears out. And certainly if there's a significant progression-free survival and ultimately a survival advantage, that may well be the case. The second aspect of your question is that sort of sequencing and order. So there's other large ongoing studies in frontline patients trying to tease out that question and adding together both a CTLA-4 inhibitor, checkpoint inhibitor, plus a MEK inhibitor and a BREF inhibitor. So actually four drugs up front to see whether that ultimately is the way to go or whether they should be sequenced. Great. So many more options for patients with melanoma and continuing positive study after positive study in this disease to the envy of uh, many of uh, the rest of us. You know, this is like the fifth most common cancer in Australia and still one of the leading causes of death in people under 35. So it's fantastic that we do have these options and treatments that are making a difference in survival. Which leads me actually to the next paper, which was a positive study in GI cancer with immunotherapy that we haven't uh, seen too much of recently. So hands, we are all looking forward to the ASCO plenary keynote 177, but we have got the paper now on neoadjuvant pembrolizumab in colorectal cancer with some quite stunning results published in Nature Medicine in April. Yes, Eva, indeed. I think it's a very interesting study, recently published, beginning of April in Nature, as you stated, by the group of the Netherlands, by the Netherlands Cancer Institute. And the first author of this paper is Miriam Chalabi. And uh, we know that immune therapy or checkpoint inhibition in general is highly active in deficient mismatch repair metastatic colon cancer, so in patients with MSI high tumors. We also know in the ones which are MSS with proficient mismatch repair genes, 
that it has almost no activity. So why is this study so interesting? Because they included actually both patients with proficient mismatch repair genes as well as deficient mismatch repair genes. So the study is called the NIS study. And what they wanted to do is to give neoadjuvants immune therapy, a combination of anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 in patients with stage 1, 2, 3 colon cancer. So what was the theory behind this? You could say, okay, why do patients respond to tumors with uh, proficient mismatch repair genes? And the idea behind this was that actually, you know, in MSI high patients, these patients have high neoantigens, they have increased intratumoral T cells, so we know that it's active there. In one with proficient mismatch repair genes, you know there is very little T cell infiltration. But actually, what the authors found was that in early tumors, you have much more T cells in there. So that could be one of the reasons why some people with MSS could also respond to immune therapy. So let me go a bit to what they studied in here. So it's not a big, big study, but I think around 40 patients where you have 50% patients with proficient mismatch repair genes and 50% with deficient mismatch repair genes. And they were treated with ipilimumab, a single dose, and then two doses of nivolumab. The goal was to keep the knee adjuvant period quite short. So why? Because you don't want to delay surgery. So the time between signing informed consent and surgery was about, let's say, maximum six weeks. So there's no delay for the patients. The results were extremely striking. So what they found was that in all patients, so 20 out of 20 patients, there was a pathological response in the MSI high group. You can say it's not a surprise. For me, it is a surprise because this is not the case in the metastatic setting. We don't see 100% response, but there it was 100% pathologic response with 19 out of 20 with major pathological response. And this is defined as maximum 10% residual viable tumors. You could say what is even more striking that in the group with proficient mismatch repair genes, so the one with MSS, there you also see that one out of four responds to the combination immune therapy. And they, of course, looked uh, in a translational way at what the reason was. And what they found is that CD8 positive, PD8 one positive T cells infiltration, that this was predictive. Also, they had a theory of adding celecoxib, but I will go very brief because celecoxib didn't seem to improve responses. So I think you can ignore this arm where they added celecoxib. I think the results should, of course, be validated in larger studies, but I think the, the results are very striking. We do have information from the Fox truck study that Max Seymour presented at ASCO last year. Yeah, so in this study, they looked mainly at chemotherapy, and you see that it seems that in the MSI high patients that chemotherapy was not as active there. Of course, the Fox truck is a very, very large study, uh, in, a, in a lot of uh, patients, but looked at chemotherapy. So I think what this study shows is that you should maybe, but it has to be validated, look into uh, the tumor biopsy of the patients, look at T-cell infiltration, and maybe give these patients immune therapy. But what we don't know is, okay, are the ones that have a complete pathological response also the ones with good outcome? And I think the Foxtrot showed this, but it has to be validated also in the immune therapy setting. We've always had this issue of whether chemotherapy wipes out the immune response that protects these tumours. So could that be a possible explanation? I think it is. I think there are lots of uh, explanations and it's a very heterogeneous group. Uh, this were also It can also depend on the stage of the tumour. Uh, we know that maybe earlier stages have maybe less tumour burden, still less... Uh, immune suppression. So I think there are a lot of variables that could uh, lead to these results. But I'm looking forward actually to the study that will be presented at ASCO, which is called the Keynote 177. And it's a randomized study, phase three, of pembrolizumab versus chemo in the first line metastatic setting. So the chemo arms are either Folfox, Folfiri, or a combination with anti-EGFR, anti-VGF. And then I hope we will know whether first-line pembrolizumab 
might be better in MSI high patients in a metastatic setting or not. But this is something we will know in, let's say, two weeks. So, Hans, this is the second exciting neoadjuvant uh, study for colon cancer uh, in a very short period of time before patients with resectable cancers go to surgery. We've now got some benefit from chemotherapy shown in the Foxtrot study presented at ASCO last year, and now with this study in immunotherapy. So do you see this as the future for operable colon cancer, some form of neoadjuvant therapy? For me, after Foxtrot, I had the feeling that this neoadjuvant chemo is a very good strategy, especially in large tumors. Uh, what we see in this study with immune therapy is that in both patients with MSI high and MSS, there is some activity, but the activity in MSI high is really striking. While you saw in Foxtrot in the MSI high patients, chemotherapy is not as active there. So I think in these patients, we should consider to give neoadjuvant immune therapy. But of course, larger studies are needed, but I'm really in favor of giving more neoadjuvant treatment in colon cancer in the future. And of course, the corollary will be less adjuvant therapy, and we'll all be happy to, to give less adjuvant therapy. I fully agree with that. Okay, great. So thank you very much for that update. The next paper that we are going to talk about is another tumour where immunotherapy has been extensively investigated and now with some pretty definitive results. So this is results of the paper presented in the plenary at AACR looking at immunotherapy in prostate cancer. Craig. Thanks, Eva. So we've just talked about two positive immunotherapy studies, and unfortunately, this was a clearly negative study in advanced patients with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. So this is a phase three study comparing enzalutamide versus the combination of enzalutamide and atezolizumab. It was a huge study with 759 patients, so it really powered to show big differences in response rate, progression-free survival, overall survival, and unfortunately it failed to do any of that with really no difference seen. So it was disappointing. There was some preclinical rationale for combining hormone receptor antagonists with the checkpoint inhibitor, and we've seen in the past with castrate refractory prostate cancer the success of uh, T, which is uh, immunotherapy in another form for prostate cancer. There had been a previous phase two study in a small number of patients with a single agent, atezolizumab, in this population, which had shown a very good response rate, good duration of uh, response and survival. So it was a little bit disappointing to see really no difference. But on the other hand, perhaps not that surprising because we know that Prostate cancer is, is basically a cold tumour in terms of the immune environment, the microenvironment. We know there's a low mutational burden and we know there's an absence of T cells. So in some ways, probably not a surprising result. There was some uh, good discussion about uh, where to from here and what the implications might be for more studies in prostate cancer because of the clearly negative results of this study. And there was some discussion about maybe there need to be use of combination checkpoint inhibitor and CTLA-4 inhibitor again, or some other biomarkers, and that really these drugs now should probably go into the neoadjuvant setting with some biomarker-driven studies to try and sort out which subgroups might respond. So we know late in prostate cancer, many uh, men develop neuroendocrine differentiation in their prostate cancer. So maybe that's a subpopulation that needs to be focused on, or there's some other biomarkers that would predict the response to the checkpoint inhibitor, because in this study, there was no signals. There was no, in all the subgroups, it was a negative study. The um, pd one level in the tumor didn't predict response, et cetera. So it's really, rather than jumping into phase three studies, it's really back to the drawing board in prostate cancer. Thanks, Craig. So the prostate docs don't need to learn to pronounce atezolizumab, at least for the moment. But there'll be some great data coming up for prostate cancer at ASCO, including some of our own Melbourne homegrown PSMA great breakthrough data. So watch this space.
So I'm just going to change tack now and briefly describe a paper that I thought was interesting that came out in the Lancet in September last year on the perennial question regarding hormone replacement therapy for menopause and breast cancer risk. And this paper is an individual participant meta-analysis of the worldwide epidemiological evidence. So prospective follow-up of many, many patients in many published and unpublished studies around the world. So many patients that around 108,000 postmenopausal women developed breast cancer in these combined cohorts. And so it was a rich source to look at all the variables for hormone replacement therapy that had influenced potentially the risk of getting breast cancer. And basically the findings were that the mean duration of hormone replacement was 10 years and the mean age of starting was at 50 years, which is the mean age of menopause. And every type of hormone replacement therapy except for vaginal estrogen was associated with an excess breast cancer risk. And that risk increased steadily with the duration of use and consistently was greater if you used an estrogen progesterone combination than estrogen alone. Amongst current users, even using between one and four years, the risk existed. And if you used between years five and 14, the risk was doubled. So basically for any given preparation, and, and of course I should refer to the fact that the tumours in these women were very heavily estrogen receptor positive tumours. The risk for estrogen receptor negative tumours is much, much smaller. The risk of in obese women was less, partly because their postmenopausal estrogen already confers a risk of breast cancer. And the paper's final conclusion was that if you accept that these associations are causal, which seems highly plausible, then for women of average weight in developed countries, if you have five years of hormone replacement starting at age 50, you increase the incidence of breast cancer at age 50 to 69 by about one in every 50 users for estrogen with daily progesterone and one in every 70 for estrogen alone, one in every 70 for estrogen with intermittent progesterone and one in every 200 for estrogen alone preparations. And the corresponding excess, if you use it for 10 years, would be about twice as great. So this is probably the definitive answer now on hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer risk. And I thought that's why it was worth mentioning. So what are you going to tell your patients when they ask you, Eva? So this is not about breast cancer patients who ask for estrogen to treat side effects of our aromatase inhibitors or even tamoxifen. This is about patients without breast cancer and what their risk is. I think the message is that very short-term use for severe symptoms is appropriate. The use of estrogen, either alone or with progesterone, as the elixir of youth to keep us all looking young and feeling young uh, and to help all of our urinary incontinence that occurs after menopause uh, has to be weighed against this breast cancer risk. So I think the controversy has gone away as to whether there is an association. There's definitely an association whatever type of estrogen you use apart from vaginal estrogen. And I think that gives clear data to present women with menopausal symptoms a choice. But again, I emphasise this is not for treating women who've had breast cancer. Okay. I thought you'd be really interested in this paper, Craig. Well, why, why are you interested in this paper, Eva? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Every woman is interested in this paper, Craig. Happy birthday, Eva. Sometimes you've got to learn uh, from oncology things that uh, relate to normal life. Radio. We're going to move to a couple of quick bites. I'm going to get you to talk for one minute, if it's possible, Dr. Underhill, on the following paper entitled Answering the Question About Flu Vaccination and Immunotherapy. Your time starts now. So with the advent of immunotherapy in everyday practice, people have been concerned about safety of flu vaccine and we probably get asked that every day in the lead up to the flu season. And the answer is, and there's been some concern that it might enhance immune response and immune related adverse events. But it's basically, uh, there's no, not a lot of evidence uh, for that. So it looks to be safe to give as it is to give the chemotherapy, although people on chemotherapy might have an attenuated response to the vaccine. But feel free to give your patients on immunotherapy the flu vaccine. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to quickly discuss another paper that relates to my life, Craig, <laughs> the randomised trial of text messaging to reduce early discontinuation of adjuvant aromatase inhibitor therapy in women with early breast cancer. The bit that relates to me of the text messaging, just in case you were confused there. So this was SWOG S1105. And what they did is we know that about 50% of women stop their aromatase inhibitors, usually around about three years into their five years of therapy, let alone 10 years of therapy. We never really want to consider this. We every Breast cancer doctor I know says all of their patients take all of their adjuvant hormone therapy all of the time. But there is some evidence from other chronic illness that text messaging makes a difference. They sent text messages twice a week, different days of the week, the weekend, different messages, and it didn't make any difference. They actually measured the patient's urine to test for uh, the aromatase inhibitor. And interestingly, there was a disparity between the urine results and the patients who said that they took their aromatase inhibitors. So it's a no for text messaging to try and help improve compliance with aromatase inhibitors. It's a shame because it really is a big problem in real life practice. Was it stratified for WhatsApp versus Facebook Messenger or? No, they were all text messages so I, it was it may have been stratified for which emoji you sent with uh, with the message okay hands we're going on to opportunity costs so you mentioned you were here on sabbatical with me i think the opportunity cost of you attending the hospital was very high or low whichever one means you were I didn't really see you very often. You, I'm you should do a study about that. My opportunity costs in uh, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a, a really interesting paper, I think, looking at the opportunity costs of receiving palliative chemotherapy for metastatic pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Yes, Eva. It, it's uh, actually a paper is published in GCO Oncology Practice very recently in March. And I think it's something which is not much studied, and that's why it's so interesting, the paper. You know, in pancreatic cancer, that people are usually not alive anymore after one year when they have metastatic disease, and everybody looks at survival curves and the gain, but not many people study how much time patients spend commuting to the hospital and waiting for care. So that's why this is a very original paper from a group in Philadelphia. And what they did is they looked over a period from January 2011 to January 2019, so actually quite a long time, eight years, all the patients that came to their center. It's a single center study, which is a bit a limitation there. Of course, it's in one specific country. But just to summarize the results, what they found is that these patients, that they spent 10% of their survival time on commuting to the hospital or waiting in the hospital or getting care into the hospital. So I think you have to keep this in mind, specifically in Australia, where you have to commute a bit further often, that you spend a lot of time sitting in the car or whatever means that you go to the hospital. Uh, in the total, if you calculate the total time of your survival with metastatic pancreatic cancer. 
I think it's something we can bring into our discussions with patients. So, Hans, are you going to actually mention this 10% opportunity cost when you talk to patients about palliative chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer? I think it's indeed something I might do. It's something I already discussed. Okay, we, the gain of survival is very little. We say that the main reason that we give chemotherapy in pancreatic cancer is the reason that they feel still okay for a certain moment of time. But that now that I've seen this paper, I will also bring up that they spend 10% of their time commuting to the hospital. So it's something you have to keep in mind when patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer treat with chemo. So Craig, in the rural setting, they might spend even longer commuting. Yeah, that's true. So I think it brings two important issues in my mind is one, the use of telemedicine, if we can, for some of the visits, um, although this is about coming into the centre for the treatment. But the other issue is, I mean, this is something that we might say, well, look, that is a really important issue and it's negating the positive benefits of the chemotherapy. But it's, it is something important to discuss with the patient because they often value small gains much more than we do. So they might say only 10%. I'll still take that if I can have that survival gain. So uh, we can pontificate about it, but I think it's something that we really, you know, need to, the patients will weigh up in their own mind whether it's worthwhile or not. We can try and reduce that 10% though down through strategies, as you mentioned, like telehealth, like having community treatment centres. That's right. And I think that's something that COVID-19, oh no, it's supposed to be a COVID-19 free podcast, but I said the word. It's something that this pandemic has brought to the fore for all of us about the way we practice care. Yeah, absolutely. We all need to take some of the positive things out of the changes in the models of care that we've made in the COVID-19 era. So that's twice we've used that word. But we need to take those positive changes and embed some of those positive things going forward. Fantastic. Well, look, that's all we've got time for this week. I'd like to thank my co-host, Dr. Craig Underhill and Professor Hans Prennan from Belgium. And thank you, Professor Eva Segalov from Monash for hosting it. I hope that these little snippets of information and discussion has been useful. Uh, But if you enjoyed it, Please join us next week where we'll have some more fantastic papers and also a preview of what's hot at ASCO. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.